it, it seems to me that the, the political elite, they seem to travel the most. You know, they're going all over the world um, in order to engage in diplomacy or, or whatever. And it, it's, it's fascinating to me that that's actually probably the thing that's going to affect them the most when it comes to this virus, that they are exposing themselves to more and more people. As a result, they are more likely, I think, to contract the virus. And it, sp- it speaks to how destabilizing... I think this pandemic really is when world leaders are just as uh, vulnerable to this virus as as you and I. Yes, uh, perhaps more so, given more that so. They, they tend to be older and they tend to have underlying conditions of one sort or another, <laughs> yeah. including stupidity. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it also exposes another interesting thing, which is, you know, if these guys were really nationalists, you know, if they were true nationalists, uh, Trump, Bolsonaro, um, then they'd stay home. You know, they, they would be going around shaking hands with their compadres and uh, co-religionists uh, across the world. But in fact, they're not really nationalists. They all belong to a kind of international of, of the right wing, which impels them to, to travel and meet one another. So uh, it's almost as if uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic, the pathogen has exposed this, this particular aspect of, of these, uh, these so-called nationalist leaders, has, has exposed them for, for what they really are. Mm, right. Uh, and I want to, I want to talk about maybe, uh, the U S healthcare system. It's a private healthcare system. And it seems to be at least with this pandemic, the federal government's had to make special exceptions to say testing, right? They say, okay, we will front the costs for testing, even though they still don't have enough tests to actually deal with the magnitude of the problem. Nonetheless, they're like, all right, you don't have to pay for this test anymore. I, I guess that's what I've heard at least. Um, and this is a this is obviously a big issue in the presidential election right now. It's come down to in the Democratic primaries between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. One of the major uh, components of the Bernie Sanders campaign is that we all should have Medicare for all, that we should have universal basic um, health care, uh, basic access to health care for all Americans, uh, among other things, of course. Uh, do you see in that view, do you think that having a more robust uh, uh, public health care system is more effective in dealing with the pandemic that we're seeing right now. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, one of the, one of the great criticisms of, of a uh, Medicare for all or, or a public health care system here in the United States is it'll cost too much money. And uh, well, it will cost. There's no question about that. No one's saying it's not going to cost a lot of money. The question is, you know, whether it's worth spending that mon- amount of money. And when you see the amount of, of money that's lost uh, as a result of a pandemic of this nature, whether we're looking simply at uh, the stock market or whether we're looking at lost uh, hours uh, in, by employees um, or the cancellation of um, uh, Broadway, sports, what, what have you, um, uh, or the the you know, the people no longer taking flights, no longer going on cruise ships. It's an extraordinary uh, cost. And it, it reminds people, or it should remind people, that um, you cannot have either a global economy or, frankly, a modern national economy without uh, having, basically, modern health care. And by modern in healthcare, I mean, it has to be national. Um, um, because, you know, the, a pandemic in particular, because it, it uh, reaches out, it, it identifies the weakest links in, in a society. Because, you know, what is a pathogen interested in? A pathogen is interested in reproduction. Uh, and it's going to go to the places where it can reprodu- reproduce the most. It's going to avoid places or i.e. bodies, which are relatively healthy, and it's going to go to places which are relatively unhealthy. Um, so if you have a health care system which only reinforces the health of the already healthy and basically neglects the health of the uh, already unhealthy, then you're basically saying to pathogens, come on in. You know, this is, is a, a big welcome, 
welcome banner to, to pathogens and path pandemics to come to your country and infect the, the most vulnerable. Um, when it comes to the global economy, you basically cannot have a global economy without modern health. Uh, and I, I haven't seen an arg argument like this maybe uh, in uh, guns, germs, and steel. He, 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 Jared Diamond does kind of come at this argument uh, in, in making the case that um, that uh, you you could not really have uh, a global economy until modern healthcare was in place. Um, that uh, it, it simply would. All of the people moving around, all of the trade moving around uh, was just simply too great an opportunity for infection to spread wildly um, and cause enormous numbers of dead people. Um, unless you had a health system, a modern health system that could handle uh, you know, a high level of potential infection, you could not have a, a modern global economy. So uh, these, I think, are inextricably linked. And, you know, th this issue, as you said, is going to come up in the presidential debate. And they'll probably, you know, as a result of this pandemic, I hope uh, people have a more informed uh, perspective because before it was just abstract. And now people really see the costs of, uh, of you know, of not having a, a modern national health care in this country. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think once it, it uh, comes out of the app, it, it's not abstract any longer and it becomes very real for people. Then people start to really embrace almost uh, uh, social democratic or socialist values. It's kind of fascinating when it's going well, everybody's like, okay, we'll take care of ourselves. Everybody take care of their own, whatever. But it seems when these types of situations arise, these become these questions come to the forefront a lot more. And I, if there's anything I could say positive that could come out of this crisis, it is that is uh, people will acknowledge the flaws in the systems that they are embedded within and they can begin to ask or push for certain reforms or policy changes that are going to make sense, you know, for the global or the national population at large. Yeah. I, I hope so. I, I mean, the, the other op, the other possibility, of course, is you know, the America First position is strengthened, and people say, you know, we should have closed the border earlier. Uh, not that there's any you know evidence to support this view. It's just that you know this is this is the position, no doubt, that Trump will push come November, um, and some people will rally behind that. Um, but my hope is that, uh, that <laughs> through the sheer incompetence of this administration, um, he will be hoisted by his own petard, um, and so he, he won't be he won't be able to save himself through his rhetoric this time. His actions will have completely undermined him. 